Hey, future respiratory therapist. So today's video is going to be probably a little longer than usual. It's also um, hopefully going to help bridge the gap from classroom um, information and theories to clinical practice. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because we all understand that the situation we're in right now where a lot of us can't go to clinicals right now, and so you're at home trying to stay sharp and what my hope is is that we pull from multiple different classes and bridge the gap on all of this. Now the topic today is going to be asthma. So we're going to talk about the the um, the disease itself, some things you need to remember. We're going to talk about clinical presentation, signs and symptoms. We're going to take you through mechanical ventilation and then talk about PFTs and everything. So I don't have anything scripted, so I don't really know how this is going to go. I'm just going to kind of wing it and see uh, what happens. Okay, I hope it's beneficial to you. So we know we're talking about asthma and let's just say that we have a patient that presents to the ER in a state of status asthmaticus. Okay, so let's just say that the patient is anxious. This is when you walk in the room, your initial view of the patient. Okay, and we can go even further. We can say that we have a 21 year old female who um, presents with shortness of breath um, post track practice. Okay, so this is a, a, a college athlete who went to track practice and she forgot her inhaler at home that day. And here she is now in the ER. She appears anxious. She's in the tripod position. You see retractions. Now when I say retractions, I'm talking about intercostal retractions as well as sternocleidomastoid retractions. So you can see that she's working really, really hard, okay? Um, she is tachycardic and tachypnic and her SpO2 equals 84% and this is on room air, okay? Now right now, you need to be thinking in your head, I have an asthma patient present. She's freaking out because she can't breathe. Okay, why can't she breathe? If you ask her, how, tell me how it feels. She probably one can't talk to you, but if she could, she could say, "Well, I can't get a breath in." Okay, I can't, I can't take a breath, and she's panicking. That's why she's tachypnic, she's tachycardic, she's hypoxemic, and we need to do two things right off the bat. Okay, now if you want to pause this video and write down what you're thinking right now as far as what you would do for this patient, then feel free to do so. But I'm going to keep moving through. Okay. Obviously, the big thing we need to do, first of all, is to fix this saturation, right? We understand that a lot of her shortness of breath is due to this state of hypoxemia. Now, also, she feels like she can't breathe. We're going to address that in a second. So what we need to do first, though, is we need to put this person on some oxygen, okay? Let's see if we can fix her acute hypoxemia, all right? Now, once we've done that, we need to talk to her. And we need to help her understand what's going on. Now, a lot of asthmatics who don't understand really what happens with their disease process, when they are short of breath and when they are panicked, they will tell you, I can't get a breath in. And that's why they're panicking. But we know as respiratory therapists that asthma is an obstructive lung disease, which means the true problem is, is that the patient can't get the air out, right? Now, if you don't get enough air out, if you'll take a breath with me right now, take a breath, but don't let it out. Take another one, take another one, and now take another one, and you can't get any more air in, right? Well, the reason you can't is because we haven't gotten any air out. And so we need to help this person get this air out, okay? She's anxious. There's all these retractions in his tripod. Now, why is she tripoding? She's tripoding because tripod position puts your skeletal um, your, 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 your skeletal bones and structure into a place that allows you to maximize your diaphragmatic drop and your accessory muscle usage. So anytime you see somebody tripoding who's usually an asthmatic or a COPD or but you see this, you need to take note because they're having a hard time breathing. Okay? So, but back to what I was saying, we got to get, help this person get the air out. Now, the most simple tool you have in your toolbox as a respiratory therapist is teaching this patient 
how to purse lip breathe, okay? So we're gonna come over here and we're gonna say PLB. And what I mean by that is purse lip breathing, okay? So we've done two things right now. We've, we've put them on oxygen to help address the hypoxemia and we're gonna teach this person how to purse lip breathe. Now I promise you if you do this effectively, okay? If you teach this person to breathe in through the nose and then out through the lips but act like you're blowing out candles against pursed lips, okay? So mouth shouldn't be open. This is gonna be against pursed lips like this. What that does is creates back pressure all the way back to the alveoli. And it causes even more of an increase of resistance to expiratory flow, but it allows for more complete emptying of the lungs. You just got to get this patient to get a little bit of air out. And in doing so, this patient will be able to get more air in. And then purse lip breathe again. Get all the air out you'll be able to get more volume in, okay? That's the key with asthma as well as with your other sea babes who can't get air out. Cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, asthma, chronic bronchitis, emphysema. If they're panicking, show them how to purse lip breathe and teach them how to purse lip breathe. It'll aid them, okay? Now, these are the two things that we're going to start with. Right off the bat, before I do anything else, I can help this patient like this, okay? But now I want some more information, okay? So I'm going to erase this, and we are going to ask for a chest x-ray. Now, on our chest x-ray associated with status asthmaticus, there's some, some key findings that you might find, okay? The first one is increased intercostal spacings. This is the space between the ribs. Okay, now you understand that this patient presents and they are hyperinflated because they can't get this air out. So, so the lungs are in a hyperinflated state. Now, if you imagine these are the ribs, when the lungs become hyperinflated, your ribs do like this and they spread apart. And this is the intercostal spacing that will be increased with an asthmatic patient that is acutely air trapping causing hyperinflation, okay? So increased intercostal spacings. You might also see flattened diaphragms. Again, due to the hyperinflation, the acute hyperinflation has the lungs so inflated that the ribs are spread out and the diaphragm is pushed down. So you might see flattened diaphragms. And then because of the hyperinflation, you have a lot more air in the thoracic cavity than normal then you're going to see a state of hyperlucency. Okay? Now those are the three big key findings associated with asthma that you need to be able to pick up on that you wouldn't shouldn't be shocked when you see them. Now why do all of these things appear? I'm going to say it one more time. Acute air trapping leads to hyperinflation and that's how it appears on your chest x-ray. Now Beyond that, you have this person who is obviously in distress, and we need to, to assess their arterial blood gas. So we're going to look at their ABG. Now, this is going to break down into three different segments, okay? Because I want you to understand not just one ABG associated with status asthmaticus, but I want you to associate and understand the various types of blood gases you might find, okay? Now, the first example that you might find with an acute asthmatic patient is that you find where they are alkalotic and their CO2 is actually down and their bicarb is normal. Now, the bicarb is normal because they don't live at a state of hypercapnia or anything like that. So their bicarb should be between 22 and 26. That's what we know is normal bicarb, right? 24 being normal. Now, we've already talked about the hypoxemia being saturations of 84%. I'm not going to put PaO2 on here. So this is pH, CO2. So this is CO2, and this is bicarb. Okay, and then this is obviously pH. All right. Now, this blood gas interprets directly as an uncompensated respiratory alkalosis. Okay? 
We also know this at an advanced level as, I just put AAH up here, but this stands for acute alveolar hyperventilation. And what this tells you is that your patient is acutely hyperventilating, okay, at the alveolar level. This is common in the early stages of an asthma attack. They, we don't just go from normal to uncompensated respiratory acidosis or acute vent failure. There's a state in there where the body says, I, I, I increase work of breathing and it presents with acute alveolar hyperventilation. This just so happens to be the way that most disease processes present in the early stages. Okay? Now, Let's say that this person did not come to the hospital in the early stages and waited for it to be an obvious medical emergency, okay? So you might also see something like this. This is 725, a CO2 of 55, and a bicarb of 24. Again, an acute problem but now we have the opposite problem on our hands. Now we have an uncompensated respiratory acidosis, which is also known as acute vent failure. This person needs to be put on a mechanical ventilator, right? We, this person is not effectively removing CO2 and probably needs aid in doing so. So acute vent failure, you're thinking mechanical ventilation. Acute alveolar hyperventilation, you're thinking maybe we can keep them off the vent. Let's see if we can get this person's airways opened up. And we're going to talk about pharmacology here in just a second, okay, or in just a little bit. Now, the other blood gas that you might find, which is probably the trickiest of all, okay, is you may see something like this. Now, this interprets as a normal blood gas. You have 735, 45 CO2, and a bicarb of 24. This is a normal blood gas, okay? But go back to the previous information that I gave you before I erased it. She's anxious. She's got retractions. She's tripoding. And now we've got her pursed lip breathing. She's tachycardic. She's tachypneic. The patient looks bad. The patient is working very, very hard to sustain this marginally normal ABG. But you can tell that this ABG is trending towards this when you consider how hard the patient is working. Okay? So what we talk about here is this phrase that we call impending ventilatory failure. Okay? Now, that's not a blood gas interpretation. This is putting my blood gas that I'm seeing plus my patient presentation, and I see somebody who may not be in ventilatory failure just yet, but they are heading that way. And unless we do something, we are going to be here probably relatively quickly. Okay? So, I want to point that out to you. Three possible different ABGs that you might see in taking care of a status asthmaticus patient. Don't be shocked if you see any one of these three and know what you're going to do to do so. I did this the other day with my students and I had a student tell me, she goes, you know, Joe, that makes sense and that makes sense. This one threw me off. I never really thought about taking the numbers and putting them with the presentation of the patient to say, the blood gas looks good, but the patient doesn't look good. And that's something you have got to learn to develop as future respiratory therapists. You have got to understand that you can have crappy blood gases with patients that look good. You should probably do something. But you can also have good blood gases with patients that look terrible you should probably do something, right? So don't ever take it from just a numbers perspective. Oh, blood gas is normal. Boom, we're done. I'm walking out. Call me if you need me. They're going to be calling you real soon, okay? All right, so we're going to go with this blood gas right here, and we're going to intubate this patient, all right? We're going to put them on a mechanical ventilator. I'm going to erase this.
All right, so here's what we got. We're gonna go AC, BC. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, wait, you have status asthmaticus. You already know that your airways are shut down. Um, you know, what, you know, why are you going VC, you know, why are you going AC, VC, right? Well, we're just going to do it for the learning environment of it, okay? Some of you may would consider going straight to pressure control, and that's fine, but we're going to do that in a second on our own, okay? Um, I told you this wasn't scripted, so I'm going to pause here for just a second. While we're talking about asthma, before we get into the mechanical ventilation side of things, let's talk about some other findings that we might find from a physical assessment standpoint that um, we haven't already assessed, okay? So first of all, when you're talking about physical assessment, you're talking about inspection, percussion, palpation, and auscultation. Now we've already talked about inspection. We already noticed that we found or we saw retractions. We saw tripoding. We taught her how to purse lip breathe. We saw anxiety. So we've already inspected our patient. But let's talk about percussion. With your asthmatic patient, when you perform percussion or if you're taking your ClinSims, when you ask for your percussion results, which you should be doing, you're going to see with your asthmatic that you're going to get a bilateral hyper-resonant note. Okay, this is due to the acute air trapping causing the hyperinflation. The uh, lung fields beneath or the lung fields are hyperinflated, therefore they are less dense and therefore they will give you a hyper-resonant note. Now, when you look at palpation, this is where we put our hands on our patients and we have them say something like 99 and we feel for the vibrations that we can feel traveling from within the lungs and the airways out to the thoracic wall, right? So we feel this. Now, remember, air causes a decrease in those vibrations and it decreases the traveling ability of those vibrations to get to the, to the thoracic wall. So with palpation, we will feel a decrease in phrematis. We will also get a decrease in expansion. Now, again, the decrease in expansion is due to the fact that the lungs are already hyperinflated. So if we take those big deep breaths again, and take another breath, your chest doesn't really expand anymore beyond what it can. And if you're already max inflated, then there's no room for any more expansion. Now from a normal resting state like this, I take a breath right now, you can see my chest expansion, right? But you'll have decreased expansion with your asthmatics because of the acute air trapping leading to the state of hyperinflation. I'm gonna say that probably several more times, but that's how important it is. Asthma equals acute air trapping equals hyperinflation and affects all of my findings because of that. Now, when we talk about auscultation, of course, we're going to hear bilateral expiratory wheezes. Now, depending on how shut down the patient is, you may have bilateral, very, very, very diminished breath sounds. And then you give them a breathing treatment and now you hear wheezing and you go, wait a second, I didn't hear any wheezing before and now I hear wheezing, what's going on? Well, what's going on is that your airways are actually opening up and you have more airflow than what you, do, what you did before. So when you're taking care of asthmatics, remember when you listen to breath sounds, you may hear tight expiratory wheezes, very, very tight, like just a very, very tight. And then you listen to them after whatever therapy you institute, you, you put it on, you give them a treatment, and you listen to them again, and the wheezing gets louder. Understand that that is a good sign with your status asthmaticus. Don't ever listen to a status asthmaticus and hear just diminished breath sounds and go, they're good, they don't need a treatment. No, they probably do. And after the treatment, you're probably going to hear some tight wheezing. Give them another treatment, the wheezing will probably get louder. Okay, that's a good sign. It's not a bad sign. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, so just rounding out the um, initial assessment of our patient, this is what we find percussion, bilateral hyperresonance, palpation, decreased firmitus, decreased expansion. Both of this is also going to be bilateral, and then auscultation, bilateral, expiratory wheezes may be diminished, um, and then vary in loudness of those wheezes. Okay, so uh, just wanted to touch on that real quick. Now, back to where we were 
when we were going to intubate this person. We were going to put them in um, volume control in the assist control mode. Okay. Now let's talk initial vent settings for here just a second. Okay. We know she's a 21 year old female. Um, now that we have a mode chosen, we need to choose a tidal volume. Now we know that to choose an initial tidal volume for our patient, we are going to use ideal body weight and we're going to shoot for six to eight mLs per kilograms of that ideal body weight. Now with asthma, don't be shocked if you go down as low as four mLs per kilo, okay? Because that is an indication for dropping down to four mLs. You don't have to use as big a tidal volumes with your asthmatics because you're probably expecting your pressures to be high, right? So we can use a little bit slower tidal volume than six to eight mLs per kilo. We're gonna choose a rate. This is gonna be in the ballpark of 10 to 16 breaths per minute. Now, if you go with a tidal volume of 400, okay, um, let's just put it up here. So we go six to eight mLs per kilo. Don't worry about her actual ideal body weight right now. Uh, let's just say, I'm gonna give you two different examples. We went with, let's go 350 here. And then this one over here goes um, 450, okay? Now if you go 350, ah, forget I even said that. If you go 350 on your tidal volume, you need to think to yourself, initial vent respiratory rate is 10 to 16 breaths per minute. So I'm gonna go 10. Well, look what you just did. 350 times 10 is 3,500 milliliters turns in to 3.5 liters. This is your minute ventilation. This is not sufficient, okay? And that is not sufficient at all. Five to seven liters per minute, normal minute ventilation, and you're setting three to five. Not smart, right? So we're gonna have to go with a higher rate, okay? So let's take our rate and let's go, um, let's just put it at 16, okay? Now when we go to 16, let me use my, use my calculator here. Uh, we're going to see that our minute ventilation, go 0.35 times 16, is now set at 5.6 liters. That's a normal minute ventilation. I'll take it. Okay. Um, we also need to set a flow. When we set our flow, our normal range is 40 to 60 liters per minute. So we're going to go, let's just, just, for example sake, let's just go 50 liters per minute. Now, if you're ahead of the ball game here, you understand that your asthmatics and your emphysematics and your obstructive disease processes also can go greater than 60 liters per minute. They may go up to 70 liters per minute, okay? And we'll talk about why in just a second. But for right now, let's just go 50 liters per minute so I can make it a scenario for you, okay? We're going to set FIL2. And let's say we had this person on a 50% Vinny mask before we uh, intubated. We'll go 50%. 40 to 60% is normal average starting range, but you can also go to whatever the patient was on that was establishing a normal oxygenation level prior to intubation. So let's just go 50%, and then we're going to set a PEEP here, and we're just going to go with a PEEP of 5 centimeters of water pressure, okay? These are our initial settings that we put this patient on. Okay, now here's what we find as we start absor ob observing what we're actually seeing from our patient. I'm going to draw you the waveforms. So this is pressure waveform. This is a uh, flow waveform. And this is volume waveform at the bottom. Okay, now... When we give this breath, we're starting at a peep of five. We're going to come up. The breath goes up and then down. And we do an inspiratory hold so we can assess plateau pressure. And then we wait and the next breath comes along, right? But for right now, let's just leave it right there. When you're looking at this pressure, what, pressure waveform, there's several things you need to understand. First of all, did the patient trigger the breath? No. If they would have, there would have been a little dip right here. Okay? So they didn't trigger a breath. So no, no, no patient triggered breaths. You need to identify some key points on this. This point here, we're gonna call it 55 centimeters of water pressure. And I know you're like, whoa, that's crazy high. I know, it's a scenario. This is what we call PIP. So this spot is PIP. 
This area here is plateau, and we're gonna say our plateau pressure is 20 centimeters of water pressure. Baseline here is peak. We got that, right? This is just labeling and understanding what you're looking at when you look at a pressure waveform. And then you have all this area underneath here, and this is what we refer to as our mean airway pressure, okay? Now, let's just talk about this pressure waveform from just a second. We know we got a problem, right? We got an asthma patient who's on the vent, and this is what we find. Nobody should be shocked. We know that with asthma, the anatomical alteration is smooth muscle constriction, bronchospasm, right? We also know that you can get an increase in bronchial um, secretion production. So we have all the anatomical alterations that are leading to an increase in our airway resistance. Well, if you think about your airway resistance formula, you see, you remember that it's PIP minus plat divided by flow, and this is in liters per second. Now, we don't actually have to calculate this right now. You can if you want to, okay? Uh, but you don't actually have to calculate it to recognize something here, okay? Our PIP is way up here. Our PLAT is way down here. PIP minus PLAT, that's this region right here, is a big indicator of our airway resistance. If you ever see a big drop from PIP to PLAT, then you should ask yourself, why does my patient have an increase in airway resistance? And the reason that's true from a visual perspective is because look, the formula says we're gonna take PIP minus PLAT. That's this right here. So 55 minus 20 equals 35. And then we divide it by our flow in liters per second. I think we went on to a flow of 50 liters per minute if I'm not mistaken. So 50 liters per minute divided by 60 seconds is a flow of 0.83 liters per second. So when we do 35 divided by 0.83, we see that we get an airway resistance of 42. Anything greater than 10 on an artificial airway is considered high. So this patient obviously has an increase in airway resistance. Not a shock to anybody, we already knew this was coming. But what I wanna drive home is understanding that this big drop between these two is an indicator. Let's say you gave another breath, let's say three hours later after multiple treatments, you come in and you find this, and you see your drop there is getting smaller, then congratulations, your airway resistance is getting less and your treatments are actually helping, okay? So, so keep that in mind when you're looking there, okay? So we obviously have a big airway resistance problem. Now airway resistance leads to the inability to get air out of the lungs. So we shouldn't be shocked when we come down here on our flow waveform and our flow waveform looks like this. Now if you're watching, you should recognize something right now, okay? This expiratory flow before the next breath did not return to baseline. And that tells you that your patient is air trapping. Okay, why are they air trapping? They're air trapping in response to the increase in airway resistance due to the acute status asthmaticus, okay? Now, when we look at our flow, I mean our volume waveform, you're gonna see something like this. It's gonna go up and it's gonna come down and you're gonna see the next breath starts and this also did not return to baseline. Now here's where you need to make a distinct note, okay? When your volume waveform does not return to baseline, it can be one, air trapping. It can be two, a leak. You could have a leak in your circuit or somewhere inside of your patient. Let's say you have a pneumothorax. You're not gonna get all of your volume back. It's not gonna come back to baseline, okay? So how do you know what's going on here? Is it air trapping or is it a leak? Well, you have to look back at your flow, and if your flow is not returning, then we know it's air trapping and that's what it is. If you look at your flow and you see your flow come up like this, 
and it comes back to baseline, then it's not air trapping and it's a leak. Okay. Now we know for us that this is air trapping and that's what we're moving with, right? So we know that that that's the problem due to the increase in airway resistance, okay? All right, that's our scalar graphics. Now, keep that in mind as we move forward because now we're gonna talk about loops. So the first loop we're gonna talk about is our flow volume loop. That's normal, okay? But when we look at this patient's flow volume loop, this is what we observe. Now, you should recognize two things here. One, you have a scoop in your loop, okay? I like to say that for my students so they don't forget it, okay? Scoop in your loop. What does a scoop in the loop tell you? It tells you that you have some sort of obstruction. Now, we already know for this patient that we're dealing with asthma, we're dealing with increase in airway resistance and bronchospasm. That's what's causing the obstruction. We know how to treat it, okay? We need to give... Uh, the pharma pharmacological agents that we need to give. We're going to talk about those in a second. But you could also get this if your patient was biting on the tube, talking about the scoop in the loop here. Okay. You could also get this if your patient had a foreign body aspiration. You could also get this if your patient had a tumor. You could also get this if your patient had excessive secretions. So there's various things that can cause an obstruction. Your job as the RT is to recognize what's causing it and then take action to fix the causative mechanism. For this case and for this patient, we know it's bronchospasm. So, so we should be trying to get these airways open back up. So the first thing here is, this, is the scoop that tells you there's an obstruction present. Now the second thing here is this sawtooth pattern that you see right here. This can sometimes tell you that your patient has secretions in their airway or secretions in their circuit or also it can be an indication of bronchospasm. And we understand now that that's what's going on with this patient, right? So that's your flow volume loop and the things you might find with it. Now, what's way more fun for me is the pressure volume loop. Now I'm gonna outline here a normal pressure volume loop. And then we're gonna show you what this one actually looks like. So this one is somewhat normal, okay? This patient's pressure volume loop looks like this. Okay? Now, some things you're going to notice, and some things should stand out to you right now. Okay? When you look at the pressure volume loop, you see how this inspiratory side comes way out, protruding this away? That's an indication of an increase in airway resistance. We're not shocked to see that because we looked at the pressure volume and we saw this. Increased airway resistance. So that should already have told you, I know I'm going to see that when I look at my pressure volume loop because I already saw it here, right? So you're not shocked. Now the other thing you notice, because our PIP, remember, was 55 Look at this right here. This is what we refer to as a bird beak appearance on your pressure volume loop. And what it tells you is that this is an indication of over distension. Okay? Now, how do I fix that? You got to turn your tidal volume down. Now, we're going to run into problems here real quick. Okay? Because we have to figure out um, how we're going to turn our tidal volume down any, any further and maintain a, a adequate minute volume, okay? But we'll talk about that as we get there, okay? But this just signifies over distension and our tidal volume is too big. We need to decrease our tidal volume, okay? Those are the two things associated with asthma that you might find on your pressure volume waveform. Now, the other thing you might find is a fishtail down here on the backside. This may happen if your patient is asynchronous, if they're working hard on the vent or if they're having a hard time triggering the vent then you may see a fishtail develop on the backside here, okay? So let's give a conclusion to what we've talked about in regards to our graphics, okay? 
we know that we have an increase in airway resistance. That is leading to air trapping. Okay, how are we going to fix this air trapping? You remember our, our flow waveform looked like this? How are we going to fix that? Well, you got really about four options to fix it. One, we can increase our flow. If we increase flow, we will decrease I time, and by decreasing I time, we make E time longer, which means more time for this to come back to normal. Okay? Two, we can decrease tidal volume. Now, decreasing tidal volume will also help with our bird beak appearance that we saw on our pressure volume loop. But tidal volume will also help reduce air trapping because reducing tidal volume in VCAC also reduces I time. If you reduce I time, then you make E time longer and this has more time to get back to baseline. The third way is by decreasing respiratory rate. Now this one works a little different. Okay, if you decrease your respiratory rate, your I time doesn't change, but your E time gets longer because you've increased your total cycle time. If you're on a rate of, what did we start at? We were on a rate of 16, right? So 16, 60 divided by 16 is a total cycle time of 3.75 seconds, which means this asthmatic patient has 3.75 seconds to get the breath in and then all the way out. All within 3.75 seconds because another breath is coming. If we turn the rate down to, let's say, 12, we can do 60 divided by 12, then we've increased our total cycle time to 5 seconds. So now the patient has 5 seconds to get the breath in and a longer E time to get it all the way out. So that might help reduce the air trapping. Now something I want to note here is that these two right here are going to alter your minute ventilation and you have to be aware of that. You take, your, you take that minute ventilation, we put the patient on, on 350 mLs and we had them on a rate of 16, that gave us a minute ventilation of 5.6. Now my patient's air trapping. Okay, well let's turn the rate down to 12. Well guess what? We just turned our minute ventilation down to 4.2. So you gotta be savvy to pick up on these things so that you fix one problem, but in doing so, you don't create another. Remember, the patient had an acute ventilatory failure blood gas. You turn the minute ventilation down from 5.6 to 4.2, here comes back. Maybe you fixed the air trapping, but you've caused the, the, the acute vent failure gas to return because your CO2 is going to go up in response, okay? So you just have to use all your clinical data. Utilize an entitled CO2 monitor to help with this, okay? Now, I told you there was four ways we could help try to fix this air trapping, which is leading to auto peep. We can also increase our peep to help stent open airways and maybe help allow for more complete emptying um, in doing so. This typically, in my opinion, works better with our emphysematics as who are dealing with distal airway collapse as opposed to bronchospasm, okay? So those are your four ways to help fix the air trapping associated with our findings um, with um, our graphics analysis, okay? Now, this patient ultimately gets better. We've taken care of them. What type of drugs did we give them throughout this process? Well, obviously, you're going to start with a beta-2 agonist. And here we're talking about albuterol or levalbuterol. These are our two most common beta-2 drugs that we give. So we're talking about albuterol and Zopinex. You should probably also consider uh, corticosteroids. Okay, so we're talking about IV um, solumedrol or IV prednisone, something to help reduce the inflammation that is leading to and causing this uh, asthmatic episode, okay? So consider uh, the administration of, of corticosteroids. Uh, beyond that, if the beta-2 isn't working by itself, you may consider adding 
a parasympatholytic to this, that would be adding ipotropium bromide, and now we'd be giving duoneb, which is an indication for duoneb. Duoneb has two indications, maintenance for chronic COPD and in conjunction with albuterol. So ipotropium bromide in conjunction with albuterol when albuterol is not working by itself. So you give this patient you know, two, three, four patients, I mean, four, two, three, four treatments, and nothing happens, they don't get better, you may could consider adding ipotropium bromide and administering duoneb, and then, of course, you're going to be getting some corticosteroids in on this patient, okay? This is in the emergency room where we're trying to get this bronchospasm reversed fast, okay? Let's talk about a few things here associated with asthma that you need to remember, Okay, um, we've kind of worked through this 40 minutes now, is, was not wanting to be this long, but this is a lot of information we're covering. And so um, I just want to give you a few points to remember as we wrap up this asthma uh, kind of all-inclusive uh, scenario. Okay, like I said, the patient was on the vent, the patient got better. Uh, of course, we went through an SBT and we weaned and all that stuff. What are some things we could do to treat this patient beyond mechanical ventilation? Well, there's several beyond mechanical ventilation and beyond um, our pharmacological agents, which we just discussed, right? Uh, what about Heliox, right? We can use Heliox to help our asthmatic patients because Heliox is a less dense gas. So we know airway resistance is, is a combination of airway diameter, length of airway, flow of gas, and also density of gas. So if you decrease the density of gas, you can hopefully decrease your airway resistance and make it easier for this patient to breathe, okay, for your asthmatics to breathe. Um, the other thing that you want to consider, this is probably on the before you go home education side of things, you want to remember that these patients should probably be monitoring their peak flows at home on, on a routine basis. Now you do this by establishing a baseline personal best. And then you do it every day. Once you know your best, you do it on a daily basis, particularly at the same time or preferably at the same time every day. And peak flow monitors have three different zones. They have a green zone, a yellow zone, and a red zone. Okay, if on a daily basis you're blowing greater than 80% of your personal best, then you are good. You means your asthma is in a good state right now. It's well controlled. If you find yourself blowing 50 to 79%, then you probably need to increase your regimen. You may want to reach out to your PCP and find out um, you know, if everything is good, but you have the early indications of a flare up coming and then red is less than 50% of your, your personal best peak expiratory flow. And in this case, you need to seek help. Uh, an acute asthma attack is present and you need to seek, uh, you know, attention to be treated um, appropriately by healthcare professionals, basically. Okay. So remember the peak flow when getting your patients and your asthmatics out of there. It's a key component of home maintenance of asthma, okay? Um, let's talk about PFTs here for a second, okay? When you're talking about PFTs, what findings would you expect to find from a patient who is in an acute asthma attack, okay? Now, remember, asthma is transient. It hits and then, it, and, then, and then it's treated, and then they live at a state of normalcy until another asthma attack happens. This is not something like emphysema that is every single day you have this same process every single day. So when you talk about PFTs associated with asthma, you got to understand that the findings that I'm going to put up here are talking about during an acute attack. Now, would you actually do a PFT during an acute attack? Probably not. But these are the findings that would be associated with it, okay? Um, we know that on our PFTs, you have your FVC and your FEV1 along with a bunch of other stuff that I'm not going into. 
FEC should be greater than 80%. So less than 80% of both of these might be an indication of an obstructive lung disease. But guess what? Might also be an indication of a restrictive lung disease. So how do I know if I have an FEC less than 80% and FEV1 less than 80%? How do I know if it's obstructive or restrictive? How do I know this is supporting of asthma or not? Well, you got to look at your FEV1 percent, which is the same as saying FEV1 divided by FVC. Now this should be no, greater than 70%, which means when I say greater than 70%, I mean for the normal person, for a healthy person, okay? And for a restrictive person. You see, a healthy individual and a restricted patient, a person with a restrictive lung disease, their FEV1% will be greater than 70%, which means that of whatever max amount of, 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 of air that they exhaled, they exhaled 70% of it in the first second. That means there's not a problem getting the air out. But when we have findings that are less than 70%, bingo, we know we're talking about an obstructive lung disease. Okay? This means that this person has an obstructive lung disease. So you can't really go off of these two alone. You have to put them together and say, of the forced vital capacity... Did 70% or more of it come out in the first second? And if the answer is no, then you're dealing with an obstructive lung disease. Okay? Now, I'm going to keep the PFTs up here, but I'm going to erase this. And we're going to talk about volumes. Okay? So our volumes here, you're going to look at several things. Okay? So you've got your TLC, your RV, and all of those things. But I'm just going to cut straight to the chase. Here's the value you're looking at when you're trying to establish if this is an acute air trapping situation, if this person has an obstructive lung disease and they can't get air out. You look at your RV to TLC ratio. And for asthmatics, in an acute situation, greater than 35% tells you that there's acute air trapping happening. Okay? Your residual volume should not be more than 35% of your total lung capacity. If it is, it tells you that you have air trapping happening and your, your, your patient is hyperinflated. Okay? So I want to make a key note there. Greater than 35% is an indication of acute air trapping. Okay? In regards to your pulmonary function testing, specifically to your volumes. Now, the last thing I'm going to touch on here is one little key note that a lot of times we forget about when we talk about asthma. And I'm going to challenge you not to forget about it. This is pheno. This is the fraction of expired nitric oxide. Now, this will be elevated with allergic asthma. Okay, it's helpful in diagnosing allergic asthma as well as titrating inhaled corticosteroids use to reduce the inflammation. Increased nitric oxide is associated with increased airway inflammation. So if we can decrease that inflammation, then we should see our, 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 our fraction of expired nitric oxide go down. But when it's high and you have a patient that's presenting with symptoms similar to asthma, and you see that, then you're going, okay, this sounds like allergic asthma. Now, why am I specifically saying allergic asthma? Well, the answer to that is because you have extrinsic versus intrinsic asthma. If you don't understand the differences between these two, I highly recommend you to do so. Extrinsic asthma is associated with an allergic reaction, such as shellfish, such as drugs, foods, allergens in the air, pollen, mold, things like that. Intrinsic asthma is more closely related to things like obesity, um, exercise, those type of things. So pheno will help us not just, not just help us recognize asthma, but it will help us even break it down even further to where we're talking about extrinsic asthma 
as opposed to intrinsic asthma. And it gives us a better insight as to how we care for this patient as we go. All right, look, guys, 49 minutes. I'm exhausted. I'm sure you probably are exhausted watching. But I hope I gave you enough information that you can start putting the puzzles together when it comes to treating an asthmatic and things you should remember and carry with you as you go out and take care of your asthmatic patients, okay? Stay healthy, guys. Stay safe, and best wishes.